Hey guys, and welcome to this, the 40th episode of Go Build a TV. We've got a ton of parts to talk about, and most notably, of course, belt-driven linear slides. I'm really excited to go over them in this show. We'll go through a quick process of how to rig up a belt-driven linear slide system and show you all the parts we developed for creating really cool assemblies. We're also gonna go over a few of my favorite new parts we've launched since the last show and do some Q&A as always. If you have any questions in the chat, make sure to ask us. We have a really sweet giveaway for you today. So if uh, we're gonna talk about what that part is, it's an unreleased kit. So we're gonna talk about it and then we will announce what that giveaway is and give you a keyword and all that stuff. I'm really excited to be back um, and I think we can just jump right into it. The first part I wanna talk about is the 96 millimeter boot wheel. Boot wheels are um, one of my favorite intake systems. Uh, they really came out of a, um, a hope to find something that is easier to implement than a surgical tubing system. I talked to a lot of teams who said, you know, hey, we really love this kind of intake, but something that requires fewer custom parts would be really great. And that's kind of what created the boot wheel for me. So it is a 30A silicone rubber. That's the same thing we use for gecko wheels and a ton of other wheels in our system, uh, like the, the high grip. And I think the shape of the boot wheel is one of my favorites. So we talked about in some situations you want to kick objects up into your robot. In that case, you can put the toe of the boot forward and you can pull those objects in and kick them up. And then in other situations, if you go to the um, heel side of the robot, we switch our camera back, thank you. You can put the heel side of the wheel forward and it'll push your objects much more linearly. So you have two options based on the orientation of your boot wheel and it has that nice eight racks bore. Sometimes it's hard to tell, but it is a hard plastic core that that soft rubber is bonded to so you get a really good positive drive. We've had a 48 millimeter and a, 96, and a 72 millimeter version of this wheel. This is the 96, so it's bigger, it's wider. It's a 12 mil wide instead of eight millimeters wide and will be really nice for intaking larger elements. It's of course not the best for this season, but in future seasons, I'm really excited to see some more of these on robots. We also released in the theme of intakes, we re released uh, grid chain. This is a really great uh, addition and it makes our plastic chain ecosystem even stronger. Here I have some grid chain and it's linked with a piece of standard plastic chain to space out those grid, uh, those grid sections a little bit more. Now these are great for intakes and moving things around your robot. You can bolt whatever component you want to these four millimeter holes. Uh, anything with the standard you build a pattern will mount right to this. So you can of course have them linked together uh, for a really compact pattern or you can intersperse them with standard plastic chain. So um, along with those, we also released our track chain. So it uses those grid chains and it has these sweet rubber slip over socks that, that fold over that uh, plastic paddle that you can bolt things to. And these are a 50A silicon rubber. So these are also very grippy, um, but they stay on that really, really well. So small scale robots, uh, really smaller than you'd see in FTC. These are, this is a really sweet drive train and in FTC, especially when you have an element that can compress, these are a really great way to move it around your robot. If you have a, a linear slide, uh, if you need to move your element from one end of the robot to the other, you can make a chain of these and they're really cool. Tumbleweed tracks, I apologize, I called them the wrong thing. I'm really, really excited about both of these. I'm really interested to see, I think there's gonna be a lot of unique intakes and a lot of um, different ways you can use these parts in FTC. Um, and I think they'll be very cool to create some small scale robots. Those of you who may not be in FTC or may create some small outreach robots, these are gonna be really sweet for that. And of course, the next one we wanna talk about is the compact servo block. The compact servo block I've been excited about for a while. Um, there have been lots of really cool ways to build more compact servo blocks in FTC out of Go Build Aparts, but we wanted to take the time to design one that really hits all of the uh, highlights of all those different assemblies. This is meant to be a lower, uh, like a lower duty, like, uh, excuse me, lower load servo block than the original ones. You'll see that the bearing support, I'll take off the servo block. The bearing is smaller and much closer to the output shaft of the servo. 
So original servo blocks will create a little bit more support for those very heavy duty applications. But for about anything NFTC, this is a really great way to get it closer to your servo and to create a much more compact assembly. One of my favorite parts about this is how well it interacts with channel. Look at a piece of channel. It is really designed around using it in channel. The width of the servo block as a whole, the servo frame is 43, and you've got lots of side tapped holes to go in channel. Um, so it has lots of orientations. You can put it in channel um, where the servo's output is there. You can flip it around. Um, it can go, and one of my favorite features is this boss that around the bearing is 14 millimeters. So you can put this whole servo block into channel and have that output come right out this, a standard hole in channel. So you can do this, bolt this servo block in, and then when you're in that application, you drop the servo hub on top, and this face is an on pattern distance from this face of channel. So it's so solidly a channel based part, it makes working with servos and channel so much better. Of course, you have the standard go build a pattern output. You've got four tapped holes and four through holes with counter bores on the back. Let's go ahead and um, mount a servo up to this. We can kind of show you how we go about doing that. So it comes with the hardware you need to screw the servo into the four threaded mounting holes. And something we didn't talk about earlier was this extra 14 millimeter hole. This can be used to um, create, to add a, uh, another bearing. Um, if you want to create some really compact assemblies there, you can have a, a jack shaft right next to the servo's output shaft. Oh yeah, um, they, Rick just asked what that second hole was used for. So you can put a bearing in here. Uh, if you're using it in channel, it lets you actually uh, constrain that second bearing. It's got a counter bore for the flange. So you could have another 14 millimeter bearing going out into the 14 millimeter hole in channel and it's constrained by this. So if you have a, something like you're creating a gear ratio between a, servo, uh, between a gear on the servo spline and a pinion gear, that's a really great way to do it. We'll go ahead and mount the servo in. Like, all, all, like most of the servo mounts we have, um, when you go to thread this in, you get a little bit of adjustment in your servo. So what I like to do is screw these in and leave this, all of those four screws a, a little bit loose. And then once we actually put on the output shaft, we will uh, tighten those four screws back down. Um, Mark in YouTube chat asks if we can talk about linear slides. We will do that right next, I promise. Um, but I'm personally really also very excited about the compact servo block. These are kind of like this and the belt drive slides um, have been two of the parts I've been probably the most excited about this season. Uh, they're definitely the parts I've been most excited about so, that we've launched so far. Um, they are both things that will improve your robots, I think, um, and definitely give you more options for... Um, will definitely give you more options for creating your robots. So we'll screw the screw that holds the um, output to our servo. We can get that tightened down. And then we can tighten those other four screws. And now we have um, this really solid servo uh, subframe that gives you not only tons more mounting, but also helps strengthen your output shaft. I think it's time to look at really why you guys came here. So what we're going to do is we're going to break down the individual parts we created to help create belt drive linear slides, bring that from an idea to a really achievable reality. Now, lots of teams have done belt drive linear slides in the past. Um, the first one that I saw was at the 2018 championships. Mecca Hamsters out of Minnesota had a really sweet assembly. And since then, I've been thinking about it. It's been, in, it's been in the back of my brain. I've been like, man, I like that. It's so compact. Uh, it may not be as compact as string, but still pretty compact. And their uh, implementation was really good. And um, I've been thinking about it. And we actually did implement it on a team I was mentoring one year. But wanted, I really wanted to make that process really easy for teams and give you a lot of parts that are almost designed for it. 
Now all these parts are designed for generally creating linear motion with small scale belts. Um, so the, that's the focus of the parts we're releasing today. We've got more parts that make creating rotational motion with small scale belts even easier. So the first one we'll talk about is the one that's probably the most obvious for a belt drive system, and that's the pulley. The first pulley we're launching for GT2, it's a six millimeter wide belt, and uh, it's a two millimeter pitch. That's the belt that we just decided to go with for this really small scale stuff. First pulley we released for it is this 60 tooth pulley. So this is a hub mount pulley. It's got four counter bores on one side, four counter bores on the other side, and it's not only designed to be hub mount, but it's also designed to capture bearings. So it's really easy to make one of these idle on a shaft. It's easy to make it idle on a shaft or a standoff or a screw because you can put two bearings in this. It is um, 10 millimeters wide. So those two bearings, the faces of those two bearings will touch in the center and it makes that assembly really clean. A four mil ID bearing is a great one to use here because it means you can just mount that to a four millimeter screw. The next part we'll talk about are our idlers for these four millimeter bearings. Uh, they, excuse me, the idlers for our small scale belt. These use four millimeter ID bearings that have an eight millimeter OD and a flange. They're kind of tough to see. I can probably get closer to the camera if that helps you guys. Um, so it uses two of those and a spacer in the center. And we have a pulley flange that I think is a, an improvement over our cable driven version to help make sure that belt can't go anywhere. Even if you do lose tension, that makes sure the belt stays in there. It's shown assembled with a screw that it comes with that you, you can then bolt to whatever assembly you have. This is especially nice for linear slides that have multiple stages because they let you take those multiple stages and give each set a very small OD belt. Yeah. Um, so those have, let's see here. I can't remember off the top of my head the flange OD on those bearings. Uh, they're a uh, nine and a half millimeter flange OD. So you can create a very compact stack of slide assemblies where the pitch of your slide system is really compact. The Viper slide system is, of course, a 12 millimeter pitch. There's 12 mil per stage of slide. So these are really designed to work very well with that system. So like I said, the pack will come with, uh, actually, it'll come with eight bearings. It'll come with four pulley shields and the rest of the hardware accessories you need to build four of those little assemblies. We also released a five millimeter length of GT2 timing belt. So like we mentioned, it's a two millimeter pitch and it's six millimeters wide. So this creates some really compact linear motion assemblies and um, it's a lot of belt. So this will give you, if you're doing a smaller belt, like a two stage kit, this will let you string it twice. Otherwise, this will do uh, a four stage kit and give you some left over. The next thing we want to look at is the uh, belt clamps. Now these are kind of interesting and I want to take a little bit more time to talk about them. So actually what I'm going to do is, let's see here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take off the belts from this kit to talk about these parts. Um, so we're gonna take those off, then we'll put it back together. And uh, actually I think we're gonna to string up this kit from, from scratch to show you just how easy it is to work with belt drive slides. A lot of these parts, um, I think one of the nice things is a lot of these belt drive parts move to socket head screws, which have that larger drive. So it's harder to strip them out, which is really nice. So um, we're gonna remove this first clamp and show you some of the, how you actually go about using these. Now these are, are a very versatile clamp. They can do, um, they can be held in a bunch of different configurations to the slide system. So you have a lot of options for what the most compact way to use them is. Um, and you may have some more options for what the most reliable way to use them is, are. So the key principle of these belt clamps is that they pinch the belts together um, with the teeth interlocking. So this creates our fixed loop that we can then loop around a spacer or a standoff. So what we do to make that system work is we take a, a length of belt that we want to affix something to the end of, we turn it over onto itself so the teeth interlock, and then we slide the belt clamp over those interlocking teeth so that those are meshed, they cannot, that loop cannot pull apart. Then we just need to have something that fills the space of that loop. So a spacer on a screw is a really great option. 
we can bolt that spacer and a screw to something and have this fixed length of loop that's wrapped around that spacer. So we'll attach that to our slide system here. We'll screw that on. And then all we can do, all we have to do is loop that loop that we created over that spacer. Then we can take the pinch bolts on that clamp and tighten it down, and that isn't going anywhere. It's super solid. Now, we wanted to engineer a couple other ways to use this to make sure in your competition robots it was gonna be insanely solid. If your slide is loose enough, you could take this and hop over the head of that screw. We'll do that right here. And we take advantage of that because setting up the system like this where you have a spacer outside of the screw, uh, spacer outside of the belt clamp is a really easy way to adjust tension. But in theory, you could have something that got in there and jumped the loop off of that spacer. So we have an eyelet is what we call it. There's a little four millimeter hole on that belt clamp that stretches out. So we can actually run the spacer and screw through that eyelet to really constrain everything. So we can take our spacer, we can pull the loop through and line up those holes. We then want to put a washer underneath that spacer just to make sure we spread out that contact, that force. And then we can run our screw through the whole assembly. So now we have the end of a belt with a four mil screw. So anything that's threaded in GoBuilda or a through hole with a nut on the other side, you can just take this and bolt that system together, which is really sweet. So that's a really great way to assemble that slide system. Um, and it creates a really robust system. This screw would have to come out for that attachment to not work anymore. So those are the belt clamps. Um, they are, yeah, really designed to be very versatile and to work in about any place you need to attach a GT2 belt. And those are the big four products that we're launching today to create these kits. This is the, this right here is the four stage Viper Slide belt driven kit. So we're actually launching, today we are launching a belt drive version of the four stage Viper Slide kit. It's got a lot of similarities to the, the cable driven version. Um, a lot of the structure is the same. The motor is mounted a little bit differently. And, you know, of course, it still has that great 974 millimeters of throw, 976 millimeters of throw. Um, but it's belt driven instead of being cable driven. It's marginally wider. Um, the, the socket heads push that out a little bit wider, but in almost every application, it'll fit in the same place. And this just gives you a little bit more reliability. So in addition to this, we're launching an upgrade kit. And that's actually what we're uh, going to be giving away today. So an upgrade kit includes all of the belt drive accessories and whatever else you need to bring your existing cable driven four stage kit up to being a belt drive version. So you can actually get that upgrade kit, use the assembly instructions for the belt drive kit and put together and have a full four stage belt driven kit exactly like if you would have gone and bought another belt drive kit. So that's what we're gonna give away. In addition to being the exact parts for this assembly, it's also a ton of very useful parts if you wanna go implement your own belt driven linear slide kit. I think this is gonna pair really nicely with a lot of other existing linear slide systems so that you should be able to drop in belt drive to your kit. And the keyword there is exclamation mark belt. Make sure you're entered to win that. Um, and if you're in the YouTube chat, unfortunately, we don't have that giveaway system working over there. So if you want to be entered to win, hop over to Twitch and type in that keyword. So we're going to let that run and we're going to choose a winner for that out of our entries near the end of the show. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take this apart really quick and we're going to show you a, a quick process of how to put it together. We'll have an edited like long, uh, it's, in about, it's about an 11 millimeter <laughs> It's in about an 11 minute long video that's going to go live uh, short uh, early next week that shows you in depth with lots of good close ups how to put this together. But um, I'm just going to show you a quick overview of how easy it is to work with. That is one of the big things that we wanted to push for for this is have something that is not only easy, reliable, but easy to adjust. Um, it is so easy to dial the tension into exactly how you want it with this system where um, with cable, it just takes a little bit more effort of, okay, now I've got to stop, untie something, and, t and tie a new knot. It looks like we have the four-stage 
Viper Slide kit, the belt driven version, that's actually on the website. So you can take a look at that and um, potentially look at that for your next slide system of choice. So we've taken all the belt out of this system and um, we'll pull all this out and we're actually going to cut a new length of belt for this because um, I want to show the whole process of like, hey, I have my kit assembled as far as the assembly instructions go. How do I rig it? But let's talk, while we're doing this, let's talk a little bit about why you would want to use belt and why you would want to use cable in a slide system. Belt is the big upside is that it's really reliable and it's really easy to use. Um, it's so hard to mess up belt, but um, you have to do it right. An upside, a big upside of cable driven systems is your motor and spool location is really flexible. You can move your motor pretty far away from your slide system and have that cable run through a bunch of uh, V-groove bearings and not worry too much about exactly where your, your motor is. You can even have it rotated 90 degrees if you run those uh, V-groove bearings in the right direction. So um, it makes it really easy to move your motor around, especially after you kind of have a rough layout for your robot. Where belt, it's got to be in line. It's got to be linear. The other thing is um, with belt, we're removing one of the things that introduce slop in a string system. In a cable-driven system, one of the big reasons you have a shift in tension throughout the stroke of the slide system is uh, wrap around the pulley. So as I wrap around my extension string, it will increase the effective diameter of my pulley. So all of a sudden I am feeding in more extension string than I'm feeding out for the return line. So that means you can have shifts in tension and we're totally getting rid of that by anchoring our, our cable our cable, our belt in this case, to the end effector, and we're just running belt through this. Now the other primary way that uh, tension gets adjusted in a slide system is how um, parallel is your return to the slide system. If you've got a big angle, so um, a good example is the belt, the cable driven two stage Viper slide kit, there's a big angle. And we can account for that angle, uh, we can account for the return cable being at an angle with a spring. A spring tensioner is a great way to do that. But with belt, one of the big things we wanted to get rid of was to, well, one of our big goals was to create a system that is just permanently mounted, it's rigid. That means that um, our return belt has to be straight. It has to be coming right back in parallel with our slide system and your tolerance for that's pretty low. That tolerance shift or that um, tension shift throughout the throw of the slide matters a lot more because we don't have a spring to soak that up. So not having that spring, I think, is overall a good thing most of the time. But it's important to know um, that you have to make sure that that's pretty solid. I think I found my loose screw that, was, that I was hearing earlier. OK, so let's go through the process of rigging this up really quick. Like I said, we'll have a really in-depth video that's got lots of good B-roll that shows you how to do this. So I'm not going to go into the exact details. But um, we'll, we'll kind of make this uh, something we'll throw together real quick. We have to start by uh, making that loop. And we are going to mount the first end to our slide system. So you'll see on this, we have our end stop plate. That's got our threaded holes. And it's held together by a screw in the middle. So it's on there. The, that bracket is essentially threaded, which makes working with this really quick and easy. We've got to loosen the pinch bolt. Um, will there be a two-stage belt-driven kit? There will be. Um, it's something that we're working on. We wanted to focus on the four-stage because it was better for this year's challenge, but the two-stage is definitely on our list of parts to work on. So I don't have an, a good ETA for you right now, but that's certainly on the way. Okay. So we'll go ahead and get this Eleven millimeter of IMAX film is about one seven point five seven point oh five milliseconds. Yeah, that's that's an Abby uh, thing to notice for sure. Okay, let's see what, what was that. 
Is there a product number? I can't find it on the site. Um, I, we may be working on launching a lot of these parts still. Making that stuff live can take a bit of time sometimes. So we're working on that. Um, so that should be coming up pretty quick here. Yes, so I think the links to the product pages should go in the chat pretty soon here. The upgrade kit, yeah, very well might not be up yet. So the upgrade kit, uh, like I said, that's what we're going to be giving away. And that includes all the components you would need to upgrade an existing four-stage kit to be a belt-driven kit. just didn't undo the pinch bolt enough. <laughs> okay. So um, we're getting this set up to be that kind of permanent mount that you can't um, take out. So, you, sorry, that couldn't fall out in competition. You would need that screw to come loose. And I think that's a lot more reliable because that screw was almost a that screw could come loose in either configuration. So the eyelet really makes that just that hair more reliable to make sure that's never going to fall out. I'm probably going to flip that pinch bolt around just because I think it's upside down. But um, yeah, it's kind of a user choice there. Now I've got a bunch of belts and I've got to start to feed it through the slide system. So I'm going to show kind of my quicker technique um, that you can totally do. But we show a different way of doing this where, you know, you feed the whole belt through um, in the video. So I think that when you feed the whole belt through, it's easier to get it correct. But I've done this enough times now that I'm pretty confident we can do this other method. Or we're going to do just the end of the belt. We're going to feed through all the bearings and then we're going to pull all of the slack out. Throughout this, if you guys have any questions, um, it definitely does not have to be about the belt drive slides, but that's kind of the focus of today. Um, ask them in the chat. With all the people entering for giveaways, um, feel free to tag us to make sure it gets highlighted on our screen here, um, especially if we miss it the first time. It looks like everything should be live on GoBuildIt.com. So you should be able to hop over there and see all the individual components and the upgrade kit. Okay, we've got all our belt fed through and now we just have to find approximately the right length. So I'm gonna make a loop of about the right length and we're gonna cut most of the excess off really quick. That I would recommend taking a couple more seconds than I did just to make sure that you got it right because it's easy to cut the belt the wrong length and then end up with not enough belt to put together your slide, which would be a bummer. So I would really recommend making sure you don't cut it too short. Discord is going to roast you for not measuring twice before hey. cutting once. Yep, uh, that's true. Which is fair. I think I pretty much deserve it. Okay, there's my other 8 mil spacer. I have too many things on the table. Okay, there we go. So I skipped a step, haha. <laughs> I didn't take the right amount of attention. Okay, so I skipped a step there. Um, I made this way too long. I am really should be looking at um, getting the right amount of slack first. So to create the right amount of tension, I like to mount the slide system a couple of different, or the end stop in the different configurations. So right now I screwed the spacer to the end stop and that's going to make it really easy to find the right amount of tension for me. So um, first I'm going to, 
let's see here. There we go. First, I'm going to um, approximate the right length of the loop. So one of the cool things about this is when you fold a two millimeter pitch belt over on itself, every tooth you move backwards is one millimeter. So you can very easily say, you know, I want one more millimeter of tension by taking that off, moving one tooth over, and then um, putting that loop back over the slide system. So I'm going to thread my clamp over that. I'm going to approximate the right length of belt. I'm going to say we're going to go about there. I'm going to pinch that belt together, and we're going to slide the belt clamp over that pinched belt. Then we can stretch the belt over that spacer and kind of a, a prox figure out how much slack we have. I think that's too much, so we're going to say, we're gonna increase that by probably four millimeters, three, four. And we can keep doing this process like pretty quickly to get to the amount of tension that we want. Now, a looser slide system is gonna move easier, um, which is definitely more efficient, which is sometimes what you want. Now, the downside is it's easier to skip. You can get a crazy smooth system um, that will that won't skip a 435 RPM motor, motor, but you could probably increase that efficiency a little bit by leaving it a little bit looser. Now the downside is, and one of the downsides to belt compared to cable, is that you always have the potential to skip a tooth, which means your encoder reading may not be accurate to the end stop. You can get that tight enough that nine times out of 10, it won't be an issue, but um, that is always a possibility. So I think this is a good amount of tension. I think this is, the motor is gonna skip this. That's my estimate. So we're gonna tighten this down. We're gonna use the quick and dirty method of an, attaching that loop. And we're gonna cut the excess off. Now, um, this is too much excess. It would run into the bearing on the next stage. So we need to cut some of it off to make sure um, we're pretty close to the right amount of, of belt. We go. Now we can hook this up to power and drive it up and down. So I have a servo commander, a 1x15 motor controller, and a battery. We'll plug all this together. And we should be off to the races. Let's see. Uh, Gates is not who we're using for belt. Um, and the idler assemblies usable with a M4 heat set insert on a printed insert. I don't see why not. I think that those would work just fine with our uh, with a heat set insert. I would make sure that they can take a pretty good amount of side load, your printed part can, because you do want to get this pretty tight to make sure it can't skip. But let's see what it does. Yep, so um, that's the sound it makes when you don't have quite enough tension to stop the motor from stalling. So in a lot of applications for a lot of teams who don't have the programming exp expertise to implement encoders, one of the things we wanted to do with this is give them the ability to run an open loop slide system and not worry about breaking components. You're not gonna break stuff if you run this all the way out. You will hear it. Um, you'll know to stop running the motor. Um, so that's kind of our, our really good way for a rookie team to use this and not have to worry about stretching out a spring or um, breaking the slide in any other way. Okay, so we want to increase the tension. That's a good quick way to test that. We'll stop and we will pop this back over our end stop. And I think we could use another three millimeters. Okay. I keep forgetting to undo the pinch bolts <laughs> on my clamps. I've done like four times now. Um, they, they work. They make it so you can't slide the belt off <laughs> or the clamp off the belt. <laughs> okay. Is it possible to mount the motor on the side, on the side instead of underneath? It is. Um, you'll just have to have some additional tensioners that move that belt, uh, move that belt path down. The big thing is this return. Like we were talking about earlier, the return belt, the belt that goes from the last stage to the pulley, needs to be parallel to the slide. If this is at any sort of an angle, 
then it's going to adjust the tension in the belt throughout the stroke and you're going to end up with more tension than you want at the start and less tension than you want at the end. Um, that's really the thing you want to keep in mind. And it's also good to keep in mind the amount, what kind of forces are acting on your slides. If your slides are way down lower than your uh, return pulley, you'll pull those slides up or you might be pulling those slides down, which isn't a good idea. Having that go straight back to the motor is really important. And that's a big thing that we had in our slide. I had a plane out here. Here, here it is. What's the pitch diameter of the hub mount GT2 pulley? Yeah, 38.2. It's uh, pitch diameter of pulleys is actually pretty easy. It's the number of teeth on the pulley multiplied by the pitch divided by pi. Um, so in this case, it's 60. 60 teeth on the pulley times two millimeters is the pitch divided by pi creates your um, pitch diameter. Okay, now we have this, this screw back in. We don't really need it as much. The pinch bolt on the side that's using the eyelet is just not as important. So um, it, I didn't have installed, it'll work just fine, but I like to have it. I think it makes it just that little bit more bulletproof. Yeah, 38.2 is a pretty, a pretty good guess. Now, the nice thing is when you're cre figuring out how many ticks to run your encoder, um, you don't have to really convert back to um, the pitch diameter. You're, lo you're working in circumference. So when you run this ro one rotation, you're moving 60 teeth of belt, so you're moving 120 millimeters. So there's a spec for the number of degrees it takes for the motor to run this out. That's the best thing to use when you're determining how far you want to run. It's really easy on a belt drive system especially because your, your diameter doesn't ever shift. It's always the same. It's easy to say, you know, move that exactly 48 millimeters up and you can reasonably do that in code with your encoder. How much extra belt comes in the upgrade kit? The upgrade kit comes with, um, comes with five meters. The four stage kit uses 1,360, I think, teeth of belts. So it uses like 2.7 meters of belts. So you get a lot left over if you make a four-stage kit. Not quite enough to make another four-stage kit, unfortunately. Uh, for what it's worth, the pulley drawings on Gabilda all only have one millimeter precision for dimension on diameter. Point 0.1, that makes more sense. Point 0.1 is, is a reasonable. I was like, one millimeter is probably not enough. The hub mount and pulley is big. Almost every single GC2 pulley is only a set screw mount. Now, um, we, are, we have some more pulleys coming. They are in a, a launch that's more geared around rotational movement. The big reason we use a big pulley here is that more teeth make it so our small tooth belt can push more torque. Um, you can get more linear force out of it because you've got a larger pulley. An even bigger pulley would make, make it so you could have less tension on more torque. If you want to keep increasing it, increasing the size of the pulley is a great way to make it so you can skip a belt less. So um, because the length of belt between our pulley and our end stop on the down stage is very short, it's really hard to ever skip it that way. We still have some skipping. We can keep increasing that, but if you're only ever using it between the end stops and if you have encoders that stop it, having that skip at the end is okay. Um, now you could totally keep increasing the, the tension on the belt system until it doesn't skip, but you can go down that rabbit hole and spend as much time as you want making that perfect. Here is a good example of a very efficient system that most of the time isn't gonna skip. Now, of course, we talked about the upgrade kit. That's what we're going to be giving away today. Um, and if you want a chance to enter into that drawing, make sure you get in the chat and type exclamation mark belt. That will get you entered to win, and we'll draw that a little bit later. Now, let's see here. Make sure I didn't miss any questions. What RPM motor? It's the 435 RPM motor. This is the motor we recommend for this slide system. Now, a lot of teams run faster motors. An 1120 is a pretty darn good uh, faster option. The couple things you need to keep in mind, uh, you can't put all that much weight on a 435 RPM motor. Let me pull up my notes here. Um, so 
keeping in mind how much your end effector weighs is a big deal when you're talking about going slower. 435, you can put a ton of weight on. Like they are, they've got plenty of torque to move about whatever you want. Um, where you have to be careful with an 1120 RPM or the 5.2 to one. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is holding up your slide system. If you have the same amount of weight on either motor, the 435 RPM is going to have, it's going to use less of the motor's available torque to hold that position. If you're sitting there holding a cone up for a while, you're just sitting there, that each of these motors are going to have to put out some current to hold that slide. And because we're not creating any mechanical power, we're not moving this up or down, all of the input current we have to the motor is it's 0% efficient. Everything we put into it is immediately turned into heat. So if you're pu pushing 10 watts of power in the motor to hold your position, it's got 10 watts of heat that is continuously pushing through it. So it'll heat up a lot faster with an 1120 than with a 435. If you pay attention to that, if you make sure you keep an eye on what, uh, you know, keep an eye on your motor temperature, make sure it doesn't ever get too hot through long practice sessions, that's okay. Um, that's totally a trade-off that you can make. Now, with an 1120 RPM motor, I would not put more than 500 grams on the end of the slide system. Now, that's including the weight of the slides, and that's a straight-up vertical slide. Horizontal slides, 1120 is so sweet. It's way fast, and it works really well. But with a vertical system, 500 grams is the most that you can put on the end, which is definitely possible with a lightweight claw and a cone. Um, even a really small intake, uh, I think you can fit in 500 grams, but you've got to make sure that that is, uh, that you keep an eye on that. With 1120, you can put 1500 grams on the end of that. That's like, that's pushing the strength of one slide system. So that's with the 435 RPM motor. You've got plenty of torque. You can use it all day long. Now getting close to the most efficient ratio possible is smart, but because you have Going uh, s slower is okay, and you don't lose as much as you think you would. Because as you decrease the load, you increase the speed. Um, that trade-off is pretty, that slope is pretty slow. Being off a little bit to be too slow is to totally fine. I currently use two 5.2 to 1 motors on 60 tooth pulleys with a 4.3 pound lift. So 4.3 is what? Uh, 4.3. 1900 grams okay yeah and on two slide systems i think you mentioned two motors yeah two motors that's plenty of torque that is a great slide system um and i would look at if you have if you want to run faster than this and have more than 500 grams look at two motors because that's a really great way to increase your power all right with that i think we can go ahead and roll for our giveaway we got a couple of last minute entries but i think we're probably good to figure out who won this thing do you have a mic over there? No. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, so I'll just read it off when it posts it in chat. So that's the end of our giveaway there. And it looks like Renner FTC has won a belt drive slide kit. Just like it mentions, shoot us an email to marketing at gobuilda.com. We'll get that upgrade pack sent your way. Um, and that should let you either upgrade or use all these components to make your slide system really awesome. With that, I think we'll let you guys go. If you have any questions about these, you can find me on Discord. You can shoot us an email to tech at gobuilder.com. And I'm really excited to see what you do with these sweet new parts. See ya.